Welcome to Living on Farms. Um, it seems like you all have been to the website, is that true? Yeah, yes. Okay. So you know, basically we're an educational organization and we also, the food that we grow, we give to the hungry. Um, and our mission is to create pathways to the future because we think that inevitably the way we're headed is going to have enough bumps in the road that people are going to want a, a, different, a different direction. The number one thing we can do more than anything else is conserve energy. That's the easiest thing that anybody can do. I mean, that's the one thing that doesn't cost us anything. In fact, we save money. If we can get everybody who sees this video to do even some of the things we're going to do in this class, it's going to be great. You know? So that's the inspiration for the class, just to you know, get to save energy. You know? For me, um, this is my house, and I regularly get the things from Duke saying, you know, you are way more efficient than the most efficient houses because I keep the temperature at 55 degrees. Um, I save gray water for flushing the toilets. You know, I, I'm religious about turning lights off and all that. I'm, that's just who I am, you know. But it, what's interesting is Richard still has found all kinds of ways for me to save more energy, which I totally love, you know. Um, the house actually, when I moved in, the last man, Ed, had also been in saving energy. And so there was a bunch of stuff already done. And we already had a blanket on the hot water heater. All the pipes below have the insulating stuff. Um, you know, he had done, and there were compact fluorescents in almost everywhere. Where there weren't, I put more in. Now we're moving to LEDs. So it's, it's got a history of that, and yet it is, and Richard will talk to you about the disadvantages and advantages of that. It is a double wide, so there's only so much you can do with it. That's about what I got to say about it. I'm looking forward to Richard doing it and to your questions, and that's it. Okay. Well, as, as we said before, my name's Richard Freudenberger. I am working with <coughs> Living Web Farms on, on these uh, workshop programs. And um, I mainly work in energy-related things, alternative energy options other than coal and petroleum. I also have had experience in natural or indigenous building, and that sort of morphed into what we call green building now. A lot of that was from my work with Mother Earth News when they had a 624-acre eco-village on the Transylvania-Henderson County line. We started in 1978 and ended up closing it in 86, but that was just the transition of ownership of the magazine at that point. This eco-village and farm was a um, testing ground, a uh, sort of a living center, a um, experimentation area. We did not only building and solar energy and, and other types of renewable projects, but we also had a number of workshops in an era where it was unusual to be able to go to an informal or non-sanctioned workshop environment. We had a fairly large budget and we were able to do a lot of experimentation and such, so we built a number of buildings and as that occurred, the building codes got more stringent just in layers of regulation and to get the word out to people, we would have to change the way we presented it to be able to embrace more people into the fold. And we were able to develop building techniques and construction techniques and just thought processes that involved and embraced a lot more renewables. And a lot of this stuff was either a problem because it was considered too radical, and number two, if it worked, it was considered too expensive. And that's the other part. We had enough funding to be able to do a lot of testing, and you know, honestly, a lot of it didn't work. A lot of things did not work, but then we'd know it didn't work. It's a lot cheaper for an individual to not have to go through that process themselves, and we could figure out that doing something didn't work and tell people it doesn't work, don't bother with that. Here's something else. In 79, we began construction on an almost totally earth-sheltered home. Not just earth burn, but actually buried into the ground. Very energy conservation oriented, very um, safe from, you know, the natural disaster kind of situations. Uh, um, not particularly too expensive, probably about 5% more than a normal construction. Passive solar design, that kind of thing. All, you know, all very cutting edge technology at the time. Um, we had developed low cost housing, owner built homes, things that you could do with, with uh, recycled and repurposed materials, which is now no big deal, but then it was, it was just a, a, a sort of a new concept, um, especially the low-cost part. And really, you can get by with, with doing a lot with, with things that normally would be thrown out. We had documented within the magazine at that point with one particular gentleman. He sticks in my mind because I, you know, I spoke with him at, at, on the phone a lot during the course of a story we were writing. He worked at the uh, landfill, and I think it was in Michigan, and um, he would see stuff come in and out, well, not out so much, but in, 
every day. And, and he ended up building a house from just the scrap that was thrown out, <laughs> you know, thrown out, just thrown out in trucks. I mean, dump trucks would come in with, construction trucks come in with perfectly good timber that, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't want to pay, um, uh, put it in the dumpster, it cost more money. They just, they just, you know, bring it to the dump or it's just more bother to bring it back and, and sort through it and stock it for the next job. So they just throw it out. The customers are paying for it. It's not, you know, the clients are paying for it, not, not the company. So that's the way they looked at it. And, um, and uh, this man, you know, he, he got used carpet that wasn't used. He got um, lumber, brand new lumber that was never, never nailed into, uh, just this kind of thing, roofing materials, just all sorts of things, even appliances, even perfectly good appliances that, that somebody used a refrigerator, for example, for you know, two months and decided they wanted a stainless steel one instead of a white one, just to the dump with the old one, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but his case is a little unusual, but that's, that's where a lot of this developed from. And, and a lot of that incentive came from the, what we now call peak oil. But it, it so happened that the founder of the Mother Earth News at that time, the magazine was, uh, John Shuttleworth was a, uh, sort of a visionary who understood the fact that we would not have petroleum forever. And there was a gentleman named M. King Hubbard who predicted in 1956 that we would run out of oil by the mid-70s. He was a petroleum engineer for Shell at the time, and he was presenting to the American Petroleum Institute a, um, you know, a professional presentation on a uh, combination of supply, demand, and geolo geological fact. I think he was a geophysicist in by, by trade, by, by training. And, um, of course, in that industry, at the end of his, probably well before the end of his little presentation, um, from what I'd read, the, the, the whispering was going around that he had just lost his mind. That he, had, he somehow had, I mean, this is totally unheard of. This guy is saying we're going to run out of oil. That's, that's crazy. It's, you know, that's what pays us. We can't run out of what pays us. You know, <laughs> they weren't thinking in terms of practical geology. But um, um, it so happens that what, what do we see about mid, about 1973? A huge oil crisis. And it wasn't necessarily at that moment we ran out of oil. He had done graphs on, uh, it's basically a, 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 um, a bell curve, you know, you, you, you reach a peak and then you, you come down. Um, he had it all figured out and, and explaining the fact that, um, that the reserves were dwindling and um, the population use of petroleum was, was growing at such a fast rate because now you've got India and China and uh, Soviet Union and develop, other developing nations now wanting to you know, own cars and, and have refrigerators. And uh, the whole publication at that point was to get people to conserve. Mainly it was energy, but also resources. I mean, trees and water. There was a picture on the wall of a vending machine in Arizona, and it said water, 25 cents. And I'm thinking, what is that all about? And he, when he took a picture of it when he was there. He said, one day, he goes, we'll be paying for water. He goes, you'll, you'll, you'll pay a dollar for a bottle of water. And, and, and you know, and everybody will do it everywhere. And I'm thinking, that's stupid. Nobody's going to pay for water like that. Well, <laughs> you know, look where we are now. And that was like 1978. So all those resources and all the energy, um, all that was the driver for what we were doing. And that has, that has transitioned beyond the magazine Mother Earth News and into the nonprofits, the, uh, the uh, corporations, the and just individuals who take the time to you know, have this vision and, and follow it. Uh, it's so much more prevalent now, but still not everybody gets it. And so we're you know, trying to show the path and, and set an example so we can sort of see how, to, how it's done and, and, and follow the correct, the correct path. For example, the average home size was around 1,100 square feet, something like that. You know, it seemed perfectly adequate. I mean, the rooms, the bedrooms were small, the kitchen was small, the living room was small, but everybody fit. And I, I do remember not, we didn't have so much stuff. I mean, it's just, it, you know, so many things to take up space. And, uh, and uh, so the homes didn't have to be that, that large. And they weren't particularly energy efficient either. I mean, it's, it's um, but, be, but because they were small, you know, the, the, the consumption of fuel wasn't that, you know, wasn't that drastic. 1973, the average home size was 1,630 square feet, which is, you know, quite a bit larger than 1,100. And now we see homes, second homes, I'll add, second homes and third homes, 5,000, 6,000 square feet. And people, you know, the only good thing about that is that people aren't in them long enough to use that much energy for the two weeks they may use that house in the course of a year, a, a, a second home or a third home. Because there are, there are many homes up, you know, I can, up on, say, Champion Hills or some other, other places that are, um, that are um, quite large and quite uninhabited most of the year. 
and, and that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you just wonder sometimes what, you know, what's going on. Take this house as an example, and we've gone through and identified about 10, 11 key points where we are using energy and where we are able to mitigate the use of that energy, like uh, hot water heating, um, space heating, uh, lighting, toilet flushing and, and water uses in the sinks and, and such, humidity and moisture control because that's more of a health issue. Things like venting properly, venting the, uh, the uh, range, venting the dryer, things that create moisture in, within the home have to, be, have to be dealt with. Eventually that can cause issues with, um, with uh, the insulation in the walls. So we don't want, you know, we don't want to encourage that. The windows are, are a very important and, and probably the least understood element in, the, in a home. Even the people who sell the windows, I've been surprised in speaking with people who actually at the wholesale level, who actually sell windows to stores, to retail, how little they understand about anything other than what it looks like. You know, how, how big it is and be able to order the correct size and supply that and what it lo how pretty it is, but other th and the functions of whether it opens, you know, like a casement or like a, like a double hung or whatever, but um, that's about where they stop and they just really don't always understand the insulation value, the light and, and heat input and all that kind of thing. So. Uh, so that's something we can we will look into. These manufactured homes are built in a controlled environment. The whole house, or more than one house, is built on a concrete pad that's perfectly level on a on a a jig. So everything's placed in the right position. The things the the building you know the uh, work environment is covered and heated. Uh, so everything's a lot more comfortable. And what they do is they is they're able to construct the homes fairly. <coughs> tightly um, and, they, and they have some other techniques that they do to prevent air leakage. Uh, the, um, and we're not talking about, this is a manufactured home, not a mobile home. Mobile homes are, are different. A mobile home is a, is a um, whole different animal as far as, as uh, coding regulations and how they're, how they're built and how well they're put together and all that. Um, they're basically built for bottom line. Manufactured homes are, I mean, pretty much they're, they're pretty well built. I mean, not some elements like the windows, for example, are not particularly good in most cases, but, but the construction itself and the actual ceiling and uh, not the ceiling, but the ceiling of the joints, um, places where air would normally leak, you know, the doorways, the window around the window frames, especially up here in the, in the corners where the roof extends over the wall outside. It notoriously in a conventionally built home, it leaks the corners are not packed properly with insulation because you have to go out of your way to actually put insulation there. And people usually don't. So, um, so the walls are well insulated, the ceilings well insulated, but where they join is not. And you will find, uh, and I, I will show you on the, when we get all this worked out. And if, if we can't, by the way, if we can't work it out on the, here, we're a small enough group that we can look, just look on the screen. But I have some thermal images of air leakage at the corners and around the windows that are sort of interesting. You can see very easily where the hot is leaking out. The rules of thermodynamics, heat always wants to go to the cold. The cold wants the heat and the heat can't help it. It just gets sucked out. So these manufactured homes are constructed quite a bit differently than, I mean, they do have studs and they have, and they have um, rafters and all that stuff, but the, they're almost always cathedral ceilings like this. So there's no, uh, normally you'd have, a, you'd have a piece of wood that goes across, across from that corner to here so the ceiling would be flat and then you'd have a nice airspace up in there and either you'd, we'd insulate the flat part from the top and then above that would be cold just like the outside or uh, in some cases they you can um, insulate between the rafters of the roof which hold you know hold the roof up uh, they can put insulation up there and that and so then you'd, you would include the whole package as being a heated space um, heating the area above above that straight line when there's no use, there's no living going on up there is, is not a good strategy because you're, you're heating another probably 20% of the home and there's nobody living up there. I mean, and uh, so this is, there's no point in doing that. That's why they normally put uh, insulation on the, on the top of the ceiling of the house when it's flat. These manufactured homes al almost always have these cathedral ceilings and all the insulation is packed into a there's a top where the shingles are and there's the bottom where the, um, 
what we see here at the drywall. And then in here, they just jam it full of insulation and it's, it's tightly packed. They do, have insul they do have ventilation channels in there so that air gets sucked from the ends of the rafters and up through uh, and exiting through the top usually so that um, moisture doesn't get trapped in there. When moisture gets trapped in there, it not only rots the wood, but moisture in the insulation um, uh, degrades the insulation so that it doesn't function as well anymore. And that's, you know, it's just a vicious cycle. The more, the less it functions, the worse it is for, you know, for heating and cooling. And then as time goes on, the, the moisture in the insulation will start to eat into the uh, uh, wood around it because the wood up there is not treated wood. It's, it's just regular wood. So uh, if it's not normally exposed to the rain, it doesn't have to be treated. Uh, and you wouldn't particularly want treated wood in a home anyway because it has uh, copper arsenates and salts and things in there that aren't particularly good for your, you know, for your health. So, uh, and, even, and even though a lot of the stuff is behind drywall or you know, in a place where it's not normally accessible, it can still seep its way out, migrate out into the, into the general atmosphere. So we don't, you know, we don't want that. In the manufactured home, there's a, it's almost like a, a boat where they'll have everything's in its place. And they don't have a lot of expanse to be able to put, say, a hot water heater wherever they feel like it or, you know, a nice little place where you can get to it. So they end up jamming it behind a closet. There's a little space. They just leave a little space behind, a, behind one of the closets somewhere towards the center of the house and they'll cover it with a panel. Very difficult to work on, but it's, you know, it just, it affords more space for the inhabitants of the house. So things like that uh, make it inconvenient to work on, but they also go to the trouble of um, insulating that, ja that, that water heater at a greater uh, level than they would normally in, in, a, in, a, in a normal house because it's, not only do they use an energy efficient water heater tank, but they also wrap the whole thing in a jacket and pack it back in there so that, you know, there'll be some energy savings. It is not expensive to, to grade up on the water heater and wrap it in the jacket at all. It would have been expensive to go through and do every window at an energy efficient level. And so they didn't, they don't want to do that, but they will, they will go to the, to the trouble of, you know, using good gaskets on the doors, making sure they're all sealed. They'll use, um, uh, you know, good, uh, Installation practice practices all around the corners and the edges and catch all that, and um, and they'll pack the ceiling well. So it so because most of the heat goes through. In some instances, seventy percent of the heat, if it's going to leave the house, is going to go through the ceiling. So uh, that's usually done you know done well. Um, underneath the house, which is a particular problem if you have to have work done on on these manufactured houses, because it is done in a um, in a controlled environment, they're able to put all the piping and everything and tuck it up into the, um, there's actually steel, like a, like a frame under here, like a steel, like a, like a trailer a and have a, has a big, big steel bar, you know, framing members that go under here. And then from the sides, there's other steel things that come out and they're able to route the pipe through all these channels and tuck it up into the bottom of the floor and, you know, staple it up or, or hang it up. And then they can, um, and then they pack that all with insulation. And then on top of that, they wrap the whole belly of the, of the uh, house in a, in a heavy plastic material. Part of that is so they can take it down the road without all this stuff f flapping out and, you know, shaking the pipes and, you know, blowing insulation out as they go down the road at 60 miles an hour. But also that it's all sealed and it's, and when it comes and is delivered new, it's as tight as it's going to get. And it's, it's, it is, you know, fairly tight compared to a, a stick-built home. Um, and uh, on the other side of the coin, it makes it difficult to to work on because when you get under here, you, like I, looking under here, I don't know, you know, the, you can see where the toilet, say, um, drain line is, where the drain and waste line is for the toilet, and this big six-inch pipe. But then you have to find the supply line sort of comes from somewhere. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, like in a normal house, you'd see it, and it comes out of the ground and it would travel 12 feet and then goes up into the toilet supply. Well, here it goes, actually goes through a mass of insulation. I, you know, I don't know if a pipe I'm looking at is, is for the toilet or for the sink. I mean, it's the only way I know is to measure, you know, I know that the toilet supply is here and I know the sink's over here and I, I, you get up here and you measure f up the top and it's, you know, three feet. So then you go under there and you measure over and, oh yeah, and you can reach up and you feel it in there. So you have to cut the plastic and you can 
do it that way. So it is a, it is a, um, uh, a bit of a procedure to work on these things. This is the house we had to work with. So it's, it's, a, it's almost in every case, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's just as good because the same situation exists in stick-built homes. You know, when I say stick-built, everybody understands what I mean. Just the just normally framed, you know, where you have a perimeter foundation or, or a slab and then you put a plate down, a piece, a piece of wood in a perimeter, and then we just put framing studs up and you build a plate at the top and then you put the roof on it. And, um, you know, it's all done piece by piece. Sometimes they build the walls on the, on the slab flat and then they, they just tilt them up and then that's one up and then you do another one, that one's up, and then they do the, the ends and that's up. Once all that's up and tied in together, uh, then they can start putting the interior walls in. But that's all still done piece by piece, one stick of wood at a time, whereas these are done, um, they have just a whole bunch of people that come in and just lay everything in all at once. But as I said, most of the, most of the um, situations we're going to look at here are, are true, hold true for whether it's a stick-built home or, or a manufactured home. This just happens to be the home that we had to work with. You know, as I said, we're going to talk about water, heat, and a lot of things, but, but energy, electrical energy, we pretty much rely on around here, our, everything's coal-powered. Not, well, there's nuclear facilities, but we don't, you know, we're not served. Um, it, our, our, our local power here comes from uh, coal, and that's really, it's what we have and what we're probably going to have for a long time coming. And, you know, I don't care how much solar there is, how much wind there is, how safe people say nuclear is and all that. It takes, it takes about 18 to 20 years to get a nuclear power plant actually generating from the point at which they get approval to when they actually you're able to plug in. So that, you know, if it's a new plant, that's not going to happen, you know, immediately. That's way out there. So that's not really a viable thought. Whether, it's, whether you think it's good or not, it's just not, it's not, it's too, it's too long term. Um, so what we got is coal. And they have done a lot of things to clean coal up, but there's no way around it. Coal is dirty. Not only coal is dirty in using it, but coal is dirty in mining it and carrying it and breathing it. I mean, just everything is is not great. And, um, um, you know, they've t they, they gasify it, they turn it into dust, they, they, there's all sorts of ways to make it burn better and burn cleaner, but it's still not a great option. Um, and the other thing is that being generated in a facility that's, well, in, in our case, it's pretty close, really, but, uh, but in many cases, it's you know, hundreds of miles from where it's going to be used. Um, we're actually seeing anywhere from 15, only 15 to th maybe 30 percent of the energy that was originally in that coal. So you, you, when you have the coal in the ground, and before it's been mined, each chunk, you know, so just say a five pound chunk of coal has 100%, we'll call that 100% of its energy. You've got to get in there with machines and dig it out of the ground. You've got to haul it somewhere to, to process it. Then you've got to um, get it to the power plant. Then you've got to, um, you know, uh, burn it, and you've got the transmission, you've got the actual uh, steam generation, it goes through a turbine, the turbine, you know, generates, the, then we've got the generation to goes to the wire, then it has to go through the wires, and it has to get transformed down to the voltage that we're using it at, so every step along the way we're losing energy, you know, 10% here, 8% here, 7% here, 15% there, by the time we plug in our appliance at the plug, you're, you've only You've only, you're only getting about 15 to, as I said, 30 percent of, uh, depending on, you know, how efficient, of what that coal had in the beginning. So it's, a, it's really quite an inefficient way to, you know, to get power um, if you're looking at just efficiency. And it's also not a particularly healthy way, but it's, it's what we have, and I guess it's one of the cheaper ways because that's what they're using. They constantly analyze the cost of, when I say they, it's the power companies, constantly analyze the cost of, um, of what... Um, what's available and they adjust as they as they can to um, to purchasing the cheapest you know cheapest source and that they, they have um, they have uh, coal-fired plants and they have pocket what they call pocket plants which are much smaller coal-fired fire, plants they also have natural gas generation power plants which are smaller um, or petroleum you know oil which is rare but they they have them um, some states, you know, hydroelectric is, is, and these are, those are renewables, but they're still available. 
Um, in some places they have wind generation, which is a you know, small fraction of what gets used, but it's still there. Um, and in uh, starting in California and then working its way east, we also now have solar farms that generate fairly insignificant amounts by percentage of, of energy, but still very significant in the fact that it works. And, and the cost has, gone, has come down you know, drastically from, say, t even 10 years ago when, when generating electricity was like five, you know, maybe f somewhere between three and five dollars a watt. And now, it's, and now in some cases it's, it's uh, you know, comparable. I mean, it just depends on, you know, what you're looking at. But uh, in, in Europe, where they are much more on the cutting edge of renewables, um, um, the uh, German government for part of a day at noon, on one day, just to, just to show it, the, in, the independent, it was an independence movement. They actually generated the equivalent of what they normally would use in non-renewable sources just out of all the renewables they had. So, I, so just to prove that it would work. But Denmark, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, all uh, Sweden, Norway, many of those countries have a very, very strong renewable resource um, development program. So they, you know, they know, they see the future probably a little clearer than we do. And I don't know why that is, but it, it just is. Well, the fact that it's there and it's dirty when we plug in is bad enough, but then using, consuming it unwisely and consuming it excessively is even worse. So as Pat mentioned earlier, just being conservative about it is, um, is like the major, major step in, in, um, in taking your first step. Uh, in just cutting back your use of, of energy. And I, when I say energy, I you know, can also think, you know, water. We'll be talking about water and, and other, you know, other things. Let's say, for example, you, you wanted to, you wanted to um, decide you wanted to go off-grid and, and not tie up to the power company. You just wanted to uh, uh, see what it would cost to put solar panels on the house and generate electricity and have your own, your own independent power station, you know, using panels like we have over there, for example. For the, for one residence and uh, which is very doable and, and not that uncommon, most people tie into the grid these days. But but prior to the ability to do that, almost all solar installations were done totally independent of of, um, of the grid. So um, if you hired a contractor to come in and and do that for you, uh, the first thing they'll do is sit you down and discuss consumption. If I have a 25 foot cubic foot refrigerator, and I, I I, as a solar installer, say you need to go down to a 16 cubic foot, and you're thinking, well, man, can I just get a 19? You know that every little bit hurts. Every little, every, every decision you make on the on the consumptive side hurts. And at the end of the day, every little thing is added up, and you'll see that it's a big chunk. It's a big chunk that you could have saved if you would if you would have not if you would have made the decision to be more conservative to begin with. So, in the case of um, <coughs> say the refrigerator, for example. Um, the idea of using, well, there's certain things you just can't, cannot use uh, in an off-grid situation. Uh, and that, those rules apply for just saving energy, too. It doesn't really matter if you're on or off-grid. The rules are the same. The thought process is the same. An electric dryer is so consumptive of power that it, it would be so expensive to install enough panels to run an electric dryer that it just wouldn't be feasible. So we have to think of an option for that. So we set that aside. Uh, refrigerators. Um, the cost of a, of a there are energy efficient refrigerators that aren't normally available in the in Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, <coughs> for example, the, for this house we looked at a Sunfrost, a Sunfrost CF. I think it was a 19, a CF 19, which is a 19 cubic foot, um, you know, conventionally sized refrigerator um, that uses. 80% less energy. In other words, it uses 20% of the energy of, of a normal, of an average uh, 19 cubic foot refrigerator you'd buy in a regular big box store. Unfortunately, that comes at a cost. I mean, that, that refrigerator, I think, was, I forgot, was it $3,100, something like that? Yeah, 3126 or something. And when we, when we talk about the refrigerators, I'll get into the, into the sort of the numbers on, on that. But, but for if you were going off grid, it would be cheaper to pay the money for the refrigerator up front. If you're just thinking about money, it'd be cheaper to pay for the refrigerator up front and let it save you energy down the road than it would be to buy 
enough panels, enough solar panels at, at $580 a pop to be able to drive the conventional refrigerator. So that's, that's the kind of mindset we have to have to think about. So we get on the line, um, washing machine. You know, washing machines not only are energy electricity hogs, but they, they, can, they, normally, they can also be water hogs. So that's two areas we can save by choosing the right you know, washing machine. Um, we're going to talk about uh, phantom loads, just the kind of appliances, answering machines, these TVs, computers, printers. If you have a little box, you plug in the wall and it goes through a little box, that's something that is transforming it into direct current. A lot of these appliances have internal um, power units that, the television is a great example, that, that will consume energy even when it's off. So we have a strategy for that by using a power strip. We can shut, we can, we can plug things like that into one single power strip and then shut the power strip off. When we say off, now we mean off. You know, the whole thing's off. There's no power going to it. The refrigerator, the uh, television has, has a power supply that's always on because it makes it convenient for when you pu push that button, the picture comes on almost instantaneously. If you had to, um, if you didn't have that instant on feature, it would take anywhere from probably 30 to 45 seconds, if not a minute, to actually warm the TV up. And it, it's just not a convenient thing. And to market a television like that is, would be difficult. So they all, they all have these, these sort of keep warm circuits in them, which are always draw. They don't draw that much, but they, they're always on. So you add up like one hour, two hours, 24 hours is one day, and then you've got thir you know, 30 days in a month and 365 days in a year. You do a spreadsheet on that and you realize that thing's costing me, you know, that's only one thing. Then you've got maybe the answering machine. Then you've got, um, you know, I, just whatever, whatever else it uses. But these are all, all things that are absorbing power when you're, you're getting absolutely no use out of them. Uh, to, to avoid that, we, you know, we have these, I mean, these things are, there's nothing special about these. They're, you know, just $9 power strips. Just, uh, and then if you can plug in the TV and the, and the computer printer and anything else, the charger for the razor and the, and the um, you know, whatever you have, just that, that little action. It would just shut the whole thing off and it's not going to hurt anything. Um, that's another thing. Uh, I mentioned the razor. That's another thing. Anything like that, they will work perfectly well. If you let them come to charge and just pull the plug out, they'll hold that charge for quite a bit of time and you're not hurting. Those batteries are designed to draw, draw down to nothing and then get filled back up again. Most people think that they have to leave it plugged in all the time. And not only is that consumptive of, you know, even a fractional amount of energy, but it's also not good for the battery to not, to not pull down and, and get filled back up again. Some batteries are not built like that, but those particular rechargeables are made to be drained down and filled back up again. So just little things like that all through the house, there's, there's things that just uh, are just consumptive that, that add up. Those are called power vampires, just, just places where we can, they're stealing energy s quietly and that's what we're trying to avoid. We, we you know, get, get rid of that. The other things are light, lighting and we'll, we'll discuss that, you know, uh, individually as we go through. But it's not only the kind of lights, but how y the lights are used that you can make your, your best choices. Um, if you have economic constriction, co you know, constricts that you don't want to, um, may not be able to afford to buy LED lighting for, uh, for the, um, whole house, you may, you may just want to choose specific areas where the LED bulbs will be more cost effective. Um, LED lighting, by the way, is incandescent lighting is just the old, the old style light bulbs, which are being phased out, by the way, the old with a wire filament through it and uh, they're, they're hot and they, that's why they waste energy. They, they, they dispense mo much of their energy in heat, not light. So uh, we're phasing them out and they've been replaced now with compact fluorescent bulbs, which um, you know, everybody knows what they look like. A ballast down here and a, uh, and a fluorescent tube with a fluorescent material inside. So when the energy goes through the tube, the, the, the powder inside glows and, you know, puts light out. Now they don't, they don't all look exactly like this. You can see some of the earlier ones were too big at the base and that's why they didn't fit into the lamps or some of them were too big at the top and that's why they didn't fit into the harps in the lamps. But they, over the years, they've improved, physically improved these and also improve the performance of them so that they, uh, you know, they work well. These are very energy efficient. Some of the earliest ones did not, were not dimmable. 
So that's a problem. Some of the earliest ones hummed and buzzed. Uh, some of them have um, cold weather issues. They, can't, they don't like it outside. There's other issues with the quality of light. Sometimes they're too, uh, too yellow. Uh, another problem is that they may dim over time. Another problem is that they, don't they take a little bit to warm up. I mean, a, a lot of these things have been resolved. They'll range anywhere from seven watts, seven watt, 11 watt, 13 watt, 26 watt, uh, 20 watt, you know, they'll, they're equivalent to the 100 watt and the 75 watt and the 60 watt and, and on down. So, so you're using a fraction, you're actually using only 13 watts when you normally would have used, um, you know, 17 or 60 watts in a regular bulb. So that's sort of the intermediate technology, but since that's happened, they've been able to perfect, to perfect the LED bulb, light emitting diode, those are compact fluorescent lamps and these are the light emitting diode. LED is a, a little, just a little diode, the little small, you know, they initially started in calculators. You can see the, you know, you can see the little buttons, you know, very small, very small light source. Depending on the, on the material they put within the diode and in some cases they shield it with different colors, they can make it, they can appear to be white or green or red or any, any color they want. <coughs> so now we have, you know, Christmas lights with all different colors and whatever. But these also went through their little, their little problems with, um, well, they're, they're expensive for one thing. That's, that's probably the major problem. They're, they're costly. The costs are coming down every year they come down. I mean, they're, they're getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, they also had quality of light issues. They're, they, they used to be or tended to be too, too cold. It was, a, it was a brilliant bluish cool light and that that was great for certain things but it's um, it's not good for um, uh, all things so the other thing was um, you know to get the to get the quality of light into the point where it could be used for a lot of different types of lights these generally used mainly were designed or, or more much more functional as task lights so if you're working uh, at this desk for example and and you just want to light just the desk down light a certain desk would be perfect or the kitchen for example but to as a dis general illumination like this where you want it all out they didn't work that well well they've they have since developed these bulbs for specific you know spot lighting general illumination uh, outdoor spotlights um, just you know a lot of different things so they're you know so they're they've now reached the point where they're dimmable um, and all the other good things that a bulb is and and also have the color the color warmth that you that is marketable so they're not all just cool white they're, there's warm white cool white and different different colors uh, available and they can be used outdoors it very specifically says if they're outdoor quality or not that, that's that's one thing to look for but the main thing about these is the life of the bulbs they are you're paying yes you are paying uh, these I guess this one I got this at Lowe's I think it was uh, 849 846 something like that um, that normally by the way would have been about 25 bucks not, three years ago same bulb um, the, um, the main thing is this, this particular bulb, I, the general market bulbs don't have as long a lifespan, but this particular one, um, well, in this, in this Sylvania's case, they mentioned the lifespan of this bulb is 22.8 years. They'll burn at least 25,000 hours, which is, you know, quite a bit more than an incandescent bulb. And there are bulbs that are out there that are, that are 70 and 100,000 hour life for if you need those are in situations where they put bulbs in places they don't want to um, go back, they have to go back and put another bulb in. So if it's at, as I said before, it depends on where you're going to use it. If it's at the top of the attic, you've got an attic, say a stairway, and you've got a light way at the top and you don't want to really be going on ladders or getting out that stick with the suction cup at the end or whatever, you put one of these up there and you're never going to have to change it again. I mean, it's pretty much up there and that's it. Um, so you can, you can choose where the best, the best choice for an LED, like uh, places like that where they're inaccessible, places where your lights, you're gonna have lights on a lot. This is a decision to make. Where if, you go, if you know that light's gonna be on a lot, like if you leave a light on for, um, you know, just to make it a security reason, you might wanna have an LED bulb or possibly go to a timer. But, you know, if you're gonna have a light on a lot, the LED bulb would be the one to choose. If you have a task lighting situation where you want a lot of bright light, It'd probably be a good choice for that because you can leave it on for a while in the kitchen, say for example, and and you know if it's a, if it's a light that's occasionally used, like in the closet or something, you really maybe be, wouldn't need to spend your money on that. You could you could still stick with the CFL because that's only 
you're only in the closet for five minutes and you shut it off again, that kind of thing. So this is the kind of strategies that, you know, the way we'll be thinking, not just the product, but the way we actually use the stuff. The bulbs themselves have, you know, come down in cost dramatically in the past, you know, three, four years. So, uh, so we can, you know, can find, you can find some good, you know, good pricing on it in the last, you know, the last quite a while. The, the thing to, and I'll, I'll go over this a little, a little more, but the thing to do is, is to really read the labels because that's going to tell you, you know, what, what the lifespans are, what the usage, usage is, whether they're dimmable, the color. Um, uh, when we get to a point where I can actually show you the color quality uh, in Kelvin color, which means it's going to be blue, bluish, hot, harsh, or warm, white, or, or anything in between. So that's, you know, that's important for the quality. <laughs>